Present. Justin Denardi. Good evening, sir. Present. Matt Eckhoff. Present. John Hansen. Bob Kuhn. Present. And Josh Stone. Present. Excellent. Um, and what about the um, Lieutenant Ryan Turley? Present. And Jeff, it sounded like you were present as well. I am here. Great. With that, we'll move on to item one, uh, which is public comment. So at this time, any member of the public may address the commission on any subject within the commission's jurisdiction that is not on this meeting's agenda. I just want any to public say, comment. I just want to say present. Jim McCarthy. Thanks, Jim. Sorry to miss you. I don't see anyone in the room who is interested in public participation at this time. OK. So with that, we'll move on to item two, new business. And the first thing up is the street light removal request. Good evening, uh, Steph Santana, City of Flagstaff Transportation Engineer. Um, I will be presenting today on the a request to remove a streetlight on Kachina Drive. So we've not received many of these requests in the past, um, but we've got this covered in the engineering standards. Um, this year, we've actually received two requests already. So what I'm going to do is just go over the six, six steps that are laid out in the engineering standards to remove the streetlight. So step one states um, an individual may request removal or addition to the existing system through a written request to the city traffic engineer. Um, this request was received by Marilee on July 13th, 2023. Um, the location of the streetlight is up on Hospital Hill, located right here in the Red Star. Um, steps two reads, the city traffic engineer will review the request to determine if it is acceptable based on a review of current engineering standard requirements and actual crash history. So the request has been deemed acceptable based on a review of the current engineering standards. Um, the engineering standard states streetlights are not required at intersections involving only local streets. This streetlight is located along a local street and a um, alleyway. So two local streets hitting together and our engineering standards today do not state that one needs to be placed there. Our old engineering standards probably did require a location like this, but it has since changed. Um, crash history has been reviewed and there are no documented crashes along Kachina Drive between Philomena and Silver Spruce for the past 10 years. Step three states that an impacted property owner's list will be developed by the city. It shall be the requesting party's responsibility to gain written approval from each impacted property owner. So a packet was created by staff and sent to the requester, including a letter summarizing the process, a signature location for all affected property owners to sign, a copy of the engineering standards, and this map showing the affected owners and the streetlight location. Step four reads, um, after written approval has been acquired and combined with the engineering standard concurrence and crash history verification documents, the city traffic engineer will schedule a public hearing to be held during the next available transportation commission meeting. So the form was signed by all affected property owners and was received from the requester on September 12th and the item was placed on this transportation commission agenda. Letters were then mailed to each affected property owner, letting them know of the removal request and date, time, and location of the Transportation Commission meeting. 
Step five states the Transportation Commission will review the submittal and receive public comment and then act on the request for modification. So what we're looking for today is a formal action. Um, step six states all costs in coordination with the local utility associated with removals additions to the system under this section shall be the responsibility of the requesting party. The city may choose to enter into a cost sharing agreement with the requesting party and any such agreement will be contingent on funding being available. So the costs associated with this removal um, are reviewed on a case by case basis. And in this case, the removal will be very simple because it's on an existing wooden pole and it's estimated to cost about $100 to disconnect. The city has also has the benefit of not having to maintain or pay for power of the streetlight anymore. Other cases may be a bit more challenging and we'll need to have more discussions when those scenarios come up. That is all I have and um, public comment or commission comments or questions I'm here for. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Are there any questions from the commission? I had one, Stephanie. Um, you said it would cost $100 to disconnect it. Is the plan to remove the street light or just to unplug it and leave the light on the pole? Yeah, so I'll pull up the picture. Um, I believe it would just be literally removing the, the I'm gonna use the wrong terms and Jeff's gonna laugh at me, but the little pole that's coming off of the wooden pole shown on this picture and the street light head and leaving the pole because there's electrical connected to it. Jeff is laughing at me. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that commentary. As someone who's not in the chambers, I appreciate the extra description. <laughs> well, if there's no further commissioner comments, then we'll go to public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this uh, specific item? Seeing none in here. Excellent. Um, is there any, so now it's time for commissioner discussion. Um, is there any discussion among the commissioners or uh, is anybody interested in proposing an action? I'll make a motion for a removal of the streetlight adjacent to 1905 Kachina Drive. And I'll second that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, is there any commentary or discussion on this motion? Hearing no commentary or discussion, um, I move to vote. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? All in favor, none opposed. Um, excellent. I like it when our commission is able to uh, actually do something in, in partnership with the city staff. So thank you city staff for all the work you did behind that. Thank you. Next up, uh, item two of section two, the city of Flagstaff annual crash report. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig and commissioners. Um, I'm going to take a second just to pull up the presentation, then I'll, I'll dive into introductions. All right, so again, thank you so much. My name is David Lemke. I'm a transportation engineer associate here at the city. And I'm Chris Fair. I'm a transportation planner with the city. And today we're going to take you through um, the annual crash report. Um, the actual report, I believe, was emailed to all commissioners, and it is uh, lengthy and covers a lot of material. So today we're just going to do a high-level overview of some of the more important uh, statistics we got from the crash report. 
And we do encourage you to look through the actual document and come back with any questions or suggestions that you may have. But uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. So for a little background, this is the second crash report that we have created um, here at the city uh, with a focus on crashes within city limits. Uh, it has a study period from 2016 to 2022. And all of our information was gathered from the Arizona Crash Information System, which has police records for all crashes uh, within the state of Arizona. And this report will be used to identify crash patterns and locations, assess past mitigation efforts, and recommend crash mitigation strategies. So at a glance statistics, this is just the total crashes within the city uh, in our study period. And um, we have a little less than 2,000 each year, and we're actually seeing a little bit of a downward trend. We've had um, the least amount of crashes in 2022 compared to the last uh, six years. And if we move forward, um, this is just that same data, but on a larger scale from 2012. And you can see that in 2020, there was a significant reduction in crashes due to uh, COVID-19 travel restrictions. Uh, and this brings us to city versus ADOT uh, crashes. Uh, as you may know, there are several major routes within the city that are owned and operated by ADOT. These include Milton, Route 66, uh, Highway 180, and Highway in sections of Highway 89, or uh, Route 66. I think we operate a lot of 89. But anyways, uh, when we looked at those crashes on those routes versus city streets, we found it was about a 65-35 split. And... Um, that brings us to fatal crashes. Uh, within city limits, we usually have anywhere from four to 10 fatal crashes. And we are on the higher end in the last two years. And if we compare those, uh, split them between city and ADOT routes, uh, it's a little mixed. Some years there's more on city streets, some years there's more on ADOT routes. And this brings us to the high injury network. All right. Uh, so as a part of the updated crash report for this year, there were two new analyses added. The first of which is a high injury network, uh, which is useful to, for determining which corridors within the city pose the most risks to roadway users. Uh, so for the high injury network, there's two main components. The first is a major streets network, which uh, was segmented based on characteristics, and each segment uh, does not exceed a mile in length. And the second main component is a total count of victims of uh, severe injury or, or, yeah, of severe injuries or fatalities in incidents across the network. Um, the high injury network identifies roadway segments that are repeatedly involved in high severity crashes and should therefore receive efforts for safety mitigation. There's a few different ways that the results can be represented, so we'll go through a couple of those. So this is the first um, first representation. It includes um, segments that had a total of two or more victims. Uh, it captures 85% of all high injury crash incidents that occurred across the network. Um, and of 303 segments in the entire included network, 93 were um, showed up on this on, in this representation. Uh, as you can see, Pretty much the entirety of Route 66 and Highway 89 corridor, uh, corridor lights up, as well as the three sections that comprise Milton Road and the entirety of Butler Avenue. So for a bit of a more refined approach, uh, this representation includes segments which had four or more total victims uh, and encompasses 70% of all high injury crashes that occurred uh, across the network. Uh, this highlights 42 of the 303 segments that were included in the analysis. And here you can start to tease out segments of Route 66, Highway 89, um, that are showing higher severity than others, as well as uh, which areas of Milton are more problematic and also represents that Butler Avenue, the Eastern segment, um, seems to be a bit more problematic than other segments. Another representation uh, represents all of the pedestrian victims that uh, were injured, were severely injured or killed uh, in the 2016 to 2022 time period. Um, it, from what you can see is that uh, around campus, 
there seems to be a lot of conflict potentially between motor vehicles and pedestrians. And these are the areas that uh, the most attention should most likely be um, paid to. And then the final representation for the high injury analysis is the uh, re pertains to cyclists. Uh, this captures all cyclist victims uh, during the time period and some new segments come to light. Uh, you can see Fort Valley Road and Woodlands Village Boulevard, as well as West Route 66, all show up in this representation where, as, as of being high severity, uh, whereas in other representations, they weren't quite reflected as severely. The second type of analysis that was added to the crash report for this year uh, is, a, is based on crash rates of intersections. Um, essentially, this was completed by assigning 2016 to 2022 crash incidents to major intersections around the city and comparing the count of crashes with vehicle volumes. Uh, the crash rates analysis is useful for identifying which intersections in the city experience high frequencies of crash incidents relative to the volume of vehicles that pass through them. So for the results, uh, it can be seen that the majority of high crash rate intersections uh, are in the downtown region or adjacent to campus. Um, Sick Greaves and Route 66 popped to, was at the top of the, um, well, it was reflected as the most severe crash rate across all intersections in the city. And attention should also be paid to Chambers Drive and Riordan Ranch, as well as others out on Highway 89, um, including its intersection with Country Club and Marketplace Drive. Fantastic, thank you, Chris. We're really excited um, to have Chris on our team. He has a lot of GIS skills and him along with Martin, were able to use GIS to make those maps that really help us identify areas that are having um, a lot of severe incidences, severe being both serious injury and fatal. And so really excited about that data to help us narrow down where we can really put our efforts in as more grant opportunities come to get money to try to make changes. And uh, move, moving on, we're gonna take a look at past mitigation. And again, this is just one example uh, from the report. Uh, there's a few more listed there, but we wanted to at least touch on one. And uh, this is an ongoing one that we looked at last year. Uh, it's Highway 89 and Marketplace Drive. We saw that there was a high number of left turn crashes at this intersection. And so in November 2019, we changed the signal phasing to protected lefts for the northbound and southbound movements. And we've seen a significant decrease in crashes, both left turn and total. The total crashes per year went from 21 to 13. And the total left turn crashes per year went from seven to two with the phasing. And the left turn serious injury crashes per year went from one to zero. So we felt this was very encouraging and like a good example of how making changes in the field, sometimes just as simple as signal phasing can have a big impact on how crashes are reported over time. Um, and that brings us to recommendations. Again, just a high level overview. Um, one of the current ones is signal review, uh, optimizing Highway 89 between Fanning and Smoke Rise. We were able to work with Metro Plan to get um, current counts for all those intersections. So we're using those to try to update the signal timing plan to reduce the number of stops and to make sure all of our yellow times are appropriate based on the speeds and the volumes. Uh, another uh, recommendation is on Highway 89 Smoke Rise Drive signal rebuild. We've had multiple citizens reach out about that intersection with uh, sight line issues and just uh, general concerns with how it's operating and 13 crashes are reported in 2022 alone. So we're hoping to uh, adjust the medians there because they're a little wide right now. So when you're making a left turn, it's hard to see past the car in front of you and potentially uh, maybe add protected permitted phasing. Uh, it's still kind of in the works what we're gonna do there. And then the third is one of our uh, systemic uh, changes that we hope to install, which is retro reflective signal backplates, where uh, it's been found if you put a three inch uh, retro reflective tape on signals, signal backplates, it has a 15% reduction in crashes across all types and all severities. It helps make the signal more conspicuous so that people see it and react to it. And so that's one of our systemic changes. And I believe that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, I hope you learned something from it and hope maybe have some questions. And if you do, we're very happy to answer them. And yeah, we'll turn the floor over. Thank you.
Thank you so much, David and Chris, um, and all the staff that helped with that. Uh, members of the commission, does anybody have any questions at this time? Go ahead, Brandon. Um, just a quick question. I, I seem to remember that, well, I don't know if it was the majority, but a large um, portion of the fatalities were pedestrian. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what mitigation measures are being put in place in those areas where these pedestrian fatalities have occurred. Thank you very much for that uh, comment and question. Um, and yeah, that's definitely something that, uh, you know, looking at the pedestrian representation of the high injury network, we can direct, you know, our efforts and attention to areas where these, uh, where pedestrians are having these conflicts and are being severely injured or killed. Um, I think that based on this first step through the high injury network, we can uh, explore patterns of crashes that are occurring that pedestrians are involved in and uh, you know then look in those areas and see if it's an infrastructure issue or if it's something else that we can tease out uh, from you know the crash data itself and um, I might uh, tack on to that that um, like Chris said I think we have a better idea of where um, the locations are especially from the pedestrian high injury network map. Um, as of right now, we might not have specific recommendations except to look in those areas and and have a better idea of what's actually happening on the specific uh, crash types. Uh, usually, or what we found is with the, this initial crash report, it's so large or encompasses such a large area of the city. We, um, the next step is try to use it to narrow down, okay, let's look at this location, specifically for pedestrians, like Chris mentioned, around campus, there are several areas that have issues and see if we can't find a solution. Um, the, the other part of it is that a uh, highway safety improvement program funding is coming up uh, next year in January. So uh, we're gonna use this information to try to um, apply for different sorts of grants or money through the HSIP program to uh, make changes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hey, David, I have a whole list of whole list of questions here. Some of these I might ask for the um, uh, the police officer who's here to help with. Um, so I, I read through the report, and one of the things that I found was interesting was that. Um, Speeding too fast for conditions was 30% of total crashes, but exceeding the lawful speed was only 1% of total crashes. And I was hoping somebody could explain to me the difference between those, those designations. Um, thank you, Chair Koenig. Uh, I am also curious on that because I, I saw that when I was going through the report and I, I have been one wanting to ask someone from the police department kind of their side of it because um, at least on our side like when it's coded we see it as being um, too fast for conditions and for whatever reason exceeding exceeding lawful speed limit has been um, underreported or it's usually not one of the ones that rises to the top so I, I might rely or, or uh, look to officer or lieutenant Turley to see what, what his take is on it uh, sure can you guys hear me okay Yep. Oh yes, loud and clear. All right, thank you. So the the exceeding or the exceeding lawful speed limit. So that's just what the road is uh, marked at. So it was thirty five miles an hour. Um, for our purposes, like if someone is speeding and we write them a citation, the the Arizona law is twenty eight dash seven zero one. It doesn't say how, if you're going. It doesn't say that you're speeding that you're going over the speed limit. It's, it's just called not reasonable and prudent for the position or for the conditions of the road. So when in essence we say someone's getting a speeding ticket, it, it's not defined if you're going one mile an hour or 10 miles an hour. It's uh, just what we 
what we think is not reasonable and prudent for the conditions. And I'm sorry, what is the other one saying? I can't remember off the top of my head. So the um, the one was speeding too fast for conditions, and the other one was exceeding lawful speed. So yeah, the lawful speed, almost everyone can have that little check mark on uh, our accident diagram forms or crash reports. Um, I think it's too fast for conditions. It's, de it's depending on the weather, uh, the, the time of day, how much traffic's on the road. Uh, there's just a lot of factors that go into that specific, uh, if we're checking that box on the crash report. Did I confuse you all or did I answer the question? Huh. Thanks, I, I think that's I, helpful. So I want to ask a clarifying question. So um, it would be relatively safe to assume that uh, the speeding too fast for conditions that these cars were most likely exceeding the speed limit posted on the road as well then? Not necessarily. It could have been um, there's snow on the road or ice on the road, uh, rain on there, you know, weather conditions can affect it. Uh, it could have been how much traffic is on the road. It's, it's just hard to say without looking at the specific accident itself, if that makes sense. Sure. There could have been hazardous material on the road, like gravel on the road or cinders on the road. It, it, there, it's just, it's one of the many boxes we can click on of how, when we investigate the accident, what we believe happened. Okay, thank you. Um, David and Chris, has this uh, report been shown to the bike and ped committees? Um, not officially. I, I don't think so. Not yet. Okay. I was just looking to see if there's any feedback from them based on what they had seen. Copy that. Yeah. I, I, I think we will bring it to them soon, um, but at this point, I don't think it's it's gone to them yet. Okay. Any other commissioner questions? Yeah, I want to, David, can you break down for me? So you, you mentioned how you're using this data to collaborate with Metro plan on some of these areas where the city doesn't necessarily control a road. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about, you know, how potential interve interventions or mitigation, fa um, you know, work can be done in some of those hot areas that the city doesn't necessarily have control or the funds over that a dot may, can you run me through that? Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Eckhoff. Yes, I can. Um, so in those areas that aren't like outright owned by the city, like Milton Road, sections of Route 66, or I think actually all of Route 66, um, we can, they usually are independently doing their own studies for safety concerns and are usually kind of tracking these things anyways and going forward with trying to address them. But um, what we're hoping to do is to collaborate with them and show them like, hey, here is uh, what we have in our data, like what do you have on your side and kind of like, what are you doing uh, to try to make changes? And it's interesting because they actually do that for us. Like they'll come and say like, hey, we've done, we're doing a road safety audit or we're looking at crashes in the city and these ones come up on our list. Like, uh, can you tell us what, what you're doing for them? So there is some collaboration between us and ADOT in that respect. Um, but I think for the most part, it's done pretty independently. I might ask Jeff for a little help on that one. Sure, I'll jump in. Yeah, so this is kind of, we did it last year, almost like a draft report. It was a final report, but we didn't have, it was kind of a summary of crashes last year. This year we've added the high injury network and a couple other things. What we've been envisioning is to take this to what you're describing and include the police department because we don't, I mean, we have Lieutenant Turley here, but we actually don't do a ton of coordination on crashes with them. So that, our idea is to kind of keep growing this program over the years. So yeah, better ADOT, we, we do coordinate with ADOT, but better formal ADOT coordination is our vision. Also police department coordination. It may, and it may also be, um, typically DPS doesn't do anything within city limits, but we often do talk to them as well when we do these road safety audits on Milton Road. David attended an ADOT, so like you said, they go the other way. ADOT invited us to a road safety assessment on Milton Road looking at pedestrian crashes last year. So they do a good job, but they have a much more mature program than us. Not 
their faces, but <laughs> in general, the program. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, well, so we're getting there. We're slowly building. So these are great suggestions and questions, and we we know it's out there, but it's not something necessarily we're doing at this point. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I certainly understand. You know, the the opportunity to mature with this. You know, this yeah. sort of you know dive into the data that exists. So thank you guys so much for doing that. And I, as a commissioner, and I don't know if other commissioners and 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 Chair Koenig, if you would agree. I would love to to dive deeper into that as you know the, the you know the next commission meetings go on to um, see how we could be supportive as a commission to these other bodies, if whether it's ADOT or DPS or these other reports to you know support the work that you all are doing and to advocate you know on behalf of these these roads that don't necessarily fall under the umbrella or the purview of the city, but certainly affect us as citizens. J didn't the last time, it's been a number of years we looked at this, and then we actually broke down some of the major area intersections and looked the next time at some of the areas that had the major crashes, because before on the, uh, on 4th Street and a couple of those areas, yeah. I remember you guys taking that in, in length and just, just where certain intersections had. Yeah, we've done that. The report last year, I think, had kind of a study of flashing yellow arrows, which was a change that we had made, and we were seeing some positive results, and then we, we don't need to keep tracking this. David mentioned the marketplace in 89 intersection phasing changes, so we're tracking that one. We looked at Schweitzer and Turquoise because the roundabout was a safety, federal safety dollars to put that roundabout in. No crash, like almost no crashes there in the past five years. Usually you'd see some PDOs, and they'll talk about that property damage only with the next presentation, but we're not even seeing those there, which is fantastic, and definitely no fatal or serious injury crashes um, at that intersection. So yeah, we track a few, and that's been the kind of been the idea is they, we got this report, it's kind of high level, as, as they mentioned, they're gonna dive in a little bit more, and that's not necessarily part of the report, but they'll kind of guide some of their work over the next couple months, and they'll start coming up with some ideas, and then we'll track those things after we make the changes. So yeah, pretty fun, and we, we see positive results, so the more we can do, the better. Um, the trend line is pretty cool that we're seeing that improvement. I don't know that it's things we're doing, but the community's growing, so generally, as a you know crash count, you generally would see it grow with your population, so it's really positive to see that go down over the last eight years, seven years. So, yeah, if you're interested in this, we could probably do a mid-year, like six months from now, just give you an update on what we've been working on. If this is interesting to you, we've been just doing once a year, but we we could do it roughly twice a year, maybe. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great from my perspective. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you seeing some head nods on the TV. Good, yeah, this is interesting stuff. Thanks. Martin, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think it's worth mentioning uh, kind of in a regional context that Metro Plan is working on its own uh, safety action plan and actually has Safe Streets for All grant funding to do a more in-depth version of a, of a a safe streets plan, I, th I think, which is going to be uh, coming up this fall. Uh, so they they cover a much bigger area, so they have a little bit less ability to get into some of the details that we can get into. Uh, but they do help uh, kind of bridge that the connection between the city and ADOT and NEU and other regional entities that that manage roadways. And then the other one, in kind of a uh, similar fashion, is ADOT is just beginning work on its annual update of its uh, state highway safety plan. And they're beginning with <clears throat> a vulner vulnerable users uh, assessment. So looking at ped and bike crashes, uh, that will lead into a specific ped and bike safety action plan. Uh, the ped and bike safety action plan will become part of the state highway safety plan, if you can follow all those steps. Uh, so, and, and in all those cases, uh, we uh, as city staff participate in those processes and sit through meetings and, and um, offer input. So again, there, that's a way of, of kind of bridging the, the gap between uh, our local roads and state roads and other regional roads um, in the middle of town. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. Um, any other questions from the commission before we go to public comment? And then we'll have a final comment after that, so. 
All right, is there any public comment on this um, agenda item? Seeing none, hearing none, uh, I guess this is a time for then, you know, further questions or uh, commissioner's discussion um, on this agenda item. Well, I want to say thank you to Matt for that comment. Um, yeah, and to echo that, uh, this is a ton of information. And um, I think, uh, you know, you say, what I heard you saying, Jeff, was that this is the initial report, and then you continue to refine ideas of what you're going to execute on. And so I think it'd be great to hear updates as you figure out what those are and as you go to execute on them uh, to report back to us with. So that sounds good. I got a thumbs up from Jeff. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and thank you so much for uh, Dave and Chris for putting that report together. Um, I think it's nice to see it growing and um, the high injury network uh, is an interesting way to envision that. Um, one of my comments, you know, looking at the heat map, it also makes it pretty clear um, how many of these are happening at, how many of the accident traffic at intersections um, but looking at the fatalities map, um, there's a whole string of them along 89, sort of out by the mall. And maybe they don't show up as bright on the high injury network because that stretches, you know, more than a broken up into multiple mile sections. Um, but it'd be great to figure out why those are happening and try and put something in, put something into place to understand and improve, you know, whether it's better crossing or, um, or what that might be out there. Yes, I agree. Excellent. Well, with that, uh, I think we move on to item number three in section two of the agenda. Awesome. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Thank you, Commissioners. Excuse me. Good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Jeremy DeGator. I am a project manager in the capital improvement section here at the City of Flagstaff. I've been a member of this community here in Flagstaff for over 13 years. I've raised three of my kids here. We have very much appreciated walking on sidewalks, biking in bike lanes, using the Foots Trail. That was one of the major items when we first moved to Flagstaff that we really enjoyed as a family. Um, and I'm excited to be here on behalf of the city, working on projects such as the one we're gonna present today, um, having the opportunity to serve my community. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Nick Hall. I'm the project manager with Burgess and Naipaul, the consulting firm helping as part of this project with Jeremy. I've been a full, uh, been living up here full time since about 2019, on and off since about 2012. Sorry. Uh, I went to ASU for my degree in construction engineering, did a master's in public administration at NAU. I've been a professional engineer for five years, a road safety professional for five years, and I am the Flagstaff office manager for BNN, Burgess and Naipaul. We've been around since 1912, started in Ohio. We've had our Phoenix office since 1984, and we just opened Flagstaff last year. So. Thank you. I just want to express that on behalf of myself, Nick, and the rest of the project team, and there truly was a team that worked on this, so we'll talk about that a little bit further. Uh, we're excited to be here. This has taken months and months of a lot of work, a lot of discussions behind the scene with that team, really hashing out what this project's going to be, what it's not going to be. So we're excited to reach this milestone. 
Just a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll just give a little bit of background about this project, some of the goals that we have for this project, and just talk about the timeline of this project. We'll go into kind of a high-level look at the corridor and the different improvements that we've got planned, and then we'll kind of dive into, we spend a lot of time looking at alternatives. A lot of this project is driven by the intersections that are contained within the project limits and we'll kind of walk through the, the exercise that we went through as a group and we'll present uh, the ultimately the selection process that we went through and present our uh, staff preferred alternative and then we'll uh, talk about some next steps and we will at the end have an opportunity for each commissioner to rank the alternatives to provide feedback on the alternatives we present tonight Quick overview of the project limits. Uh, this is largely located on Butler Avenue and 4th Street. Uh, starting over in the area of Little America, this extends to the east over tying in at the Sanawa Heights subdivision. On 4th Street, we tie in somewhere south of Sparrow Avenue, continue down through the Butler Avenue intersection and tie into the uh, development that's currently underway there at Canyon Del Rio, just south of Butler. Project background. Uh, at, at its heart, uh, this project serves to widen the existing two lanes section along for Butler and 4th Street um, to a, a full complete street section that includes four lanes, two lanes in each direction and a median. This project was originally two separate projects. It was the Butler Avenue widening project and it was the Butler 4th Street intersection improvements projects. They were combined into one project. The project is funded by Propositions 403 and 419, which are more commonly known by the old transportation tax and the new transportation tax. Uh, the original transportation tax was approved back in 2000. Uh, the new transportation tax was re-upped back in 2020 and went into, or back in 2018, and went into an effect in 2020. And then we also have a substantial uh, portion of developer contributions. So as you're probably aware, along this stretch of Butler Avenue, there's been a lot of development activity over the last several years. And in lieu of the developers going out there and constructing new edge improvements, driveway sidewalks and such that would be removed and replaced as part of this project, they contribute money to the city and we build those final improvements in their ultimate location. We're not going to spend a lot of time on uh, some of the aspects of the project, uh, but I did want to briefly touch base on the Butler Avenue and Harold Ranch Road roundabout. Uh, this, this intersection will be realigned, so Harold Ranch Road will be straightened out and will come in more in line with the eastern property line of Black Barts, if you're familiar with the, the RV. Uh, location, um, and it will be a roundabout. And this is driven largely by um, we will be installing the median that I mentioned earlier, and this will essentially uh, control or limit access, uh, specifically for left turns. Um, the primary example being uh, the Little America truck stop. Trucks that currently exit being able to make a left turn will no longer be able to perform that movement. They'll be required to make a right turn, proceed down to the roundabout at, at Harold Ranch, make a U-turn operation to return back to the interstate. As I mentioned, we spent a lot of time uh, with the project team. This project team included uh, a wide spread of engineers. We had capital improvements. We had our transportation staff. We had multimodal, multimodal staff. We had streets, sustainability, water services, parks and rec. We also included our private stakeholders and our other public stakeholders, such as ADOT. We had Mountain Line also coordinated with some of the private landholders, specifically on the western end of the project that had been previously developed, such as Little America, uh, the mobile gas station, and Black Barts. We are currently in this scoping outreach phase, so we have done a lot of this preliminary work, and I do want to stress that what you're going to see here tonight is all preliminary. So you're going to see a lot of lines on paper and conceptual level designs, but they're just that. They're only preliminary. None of this stuff is set in stone. Um, so they're really just to convey like general lane configurations, number of lanes, and the general layout that one would expect. 
We have already gone to a number of commissions. We went to the Bicycle Advisory and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. We've been to the Commission on Inclusion and Adaptive Living. And last week we were with Sustainability. We will, we're here tonight and we will be holding a public meeting at the Aquaplex on October 18th, 5.30 to 7. And we'll have more information about this at the end. Um, so we invite everyone to be there to, to engage with the project, that opportunity. And then we will ultimately be going to City Council in early November. We talked a little bit about all of the development that's already happened on this corridor. Uh, this, the green areas are areas that have already developed um, over, the, over the past um, decades. Uh, the areas in yellow are planned. The areas in uh, pink salmon, I guess the primary one being the Canyon del Rio, which is located on that uh, southwest corner of Butler and Forth. These are significant and they really drive the, the growth that we expect to see throughout this um, corridor, uh, both now and into the future. Um, this is also where the future JWP alignment would tie in there at Butler and Forth coming in for the south. Although at this point, you know, that's somewhere in the seven to 10 year range before that likely connects. I just want to use this opportunity to kind of put like Canyon del Rio in perspective. You know, it's relatively large on here, but it's a, it's a significant development. So it's about roughly 1500 housing units between single family homes, apartments, townhomes. And to put that in perspective, this is roughly equal to another country club or two Cheshire Linwoods. Um, and then there's a retail component. And um, this is roughly equal to the Fry Shopping Center, like three times that Fry Shopping Center is roughly what's contained within that Canyon del Rio. And this is, as you've been out there, this is under construction. This will be coming online within the next three to five years. Project goals. So at the very beginning, we held our project charter, which was really like setting the foundation of what this project is going to hold as its foundation. Um, and it really can boil down to improving facilities for all modes and users of the corridor. And that served as the basis for the conversations, the decisions, and so on that we had. Much of this is grounded in a number of plans. So under consideration, we have the regional plan, uh, which you know, dictates some level of roadway capacity um, in line with approved development and adjacent zoning. We've got the carbon neutrality plan. We've got the active transportation master plan, and we have Metro plans, uh, Flagstaff in motion, or not Metro, plan, I'm sorry, mountain lines, Flagstaff in motion transit plan. And ultimately it boils down to us achieving the highest level of safety for all users. And it's serendipitous that we were here tonight just following a presentation on crash reports. Um, and we know that speed matters, right? We just had a discussion about that, that higher speeds lead to worse outcomes. So talking a little bit more on the safety of the project and the vision zero alignment, that achieving this goal that has been well stated that Safety is paramount for this project as well as any project within the city. But through Vision Zero, the approach we take to achieve this is the safe systems approach, which is the concept that mistakes will happen, that we need to be prepared and have redundant systems in place for when mistakes happen. This also looks at safe vehicles, safe users, safe roads, I believe uh, EMS is factored into there. There's all the factors. It's not just one thing that makes a road safe that how many lanes or the guardrail, it can't just be engineered to be safe. There's so many other factors going into it. Of course, we need to engineer as much as we can to make it safe in that same regard. Another piece though that is, you'll see through the graphics we have of what this project will be and the features for ped bike um, that will be developed as part of this project. One of those concepts is separation of time and space. That if we can more likely increase the chance that pedestrians and bicycles will have less time in occupying the same space as vehicles that will greatly help our safety overall. So with this project uh, coming up in the next few slides, you'll see some of those features, but that's one of the concepts that we'll touch back on later. So this is a typical cross section for a minor arterial, which is what both Forestry and Butler Avenue 
what Butler Avenue are. And it generally consists of two 12 foot travel lanes. It's got an on-street bike lane. It's got a curb and gutter and then a five foot parkway as we call it, which is just a furnishing or landscaping strip. And then it's got a six foot sidewalk. So this is the basis, like without any modifications, this is where this project would start. However, very early on, we made the decision as a project team and based on the direction that we have heard over the, the ensuing years um, about where we're headed as a community, um, to, to revisit this overall cross section because we know that these things matter. And so I'll just quickly walk through what we're seeing here. Uh, the travel lanes, there's still two travel lanes in each direction, but they're now 11 feet wide. So we've removed a foot from each travel lane. We have the center median as before. We also, there, now there's no on-street bike lane. It has actually been physically relocated uh, vertically and horizontally. So we still have our curb and gutter and that five foot furnishing parkway strip. And then we have directional bike lanes and, and sidewalks on either side. So a five foot bike lane and a six foot sidewalk on either side of the street. This uh, physically separates those users from, from vehicle traffic. Um, supports all of the different um, comfort levels um, of those users and provides different opportunities. We react differently when there's a curb directly adjacent to us. So like a bike lane that's unoccupied is open space and, and makes that feel a little, little bit more open. By removing that bike lane, we constrict that cross section a little bit. We, can, we have median landscaping. We have landscaping in that uh, parkway strip. All of these serve to reduce speeds along the corridor. We also, as a project team, made the decision to actually reduce design speeds for this corridor um, from what they would historically be. As we mentioned, the big, the big change as it relates to this project is that uh, the bicycle and pedestrian treatments and this off street bike lane and sidewalk. So this will be, we haven't decided on final striping or so on, but this will be a directional bike lane. So it'll be one direction on each side, but it will be essentially a, a very nice separated facility on each side of the street uh, that supports, like I mentioned, all of those users from someone that, that is not willing to accept any stress um, to someone that is highly confident. So it will serve all of those users. We will talk a little bit more about this when we get to the intersections, but there are any of our crossings that are intersections will have protected intersection. Um, and this generally refers to um, some of the geometry and, and the green paint that you've probably seen around town. Those are some of the hallmarks of prote protected intersection crossings. We talked a little bit about this before, right? We talked about vision zero. The only, you know, the only level of acceptable depths is zero. Like that's the only acceptable outcome for this. And we know that that is largely driven by speeds. And what we're seeing here, um, the, the speeds that you're showing, those aren't speed limits. Those are speeds that the vehicle is traveling when, um, when a pedestrian is involved. Um, and we see a dramatic difference between 20 miles an hour where we have a very high survivability rate versus 40 miles an hour and where that, that survivability rates drops drastically. So whatever we can do uh, through design, through redundant measures to reduce that overall speed through the corridor at intersections is absolutely critical to achieving that, that vision zero, getting down to zero deaths. All right, so to start talking on some of the features throughout the corridor, um, we, this is looking at the west end of the project, approximately between the Little America site and the overnight truck parking uh, on the north side of this graphic on the right. We're looking at putting a mid-block crossing in at this location. There's a paired bus stop there already. The truck drivers that use both facilities on the north and south side do cross quite often here as well. With the raised median being put in in this section, it does offer the opportunity to have the Z crossing and the area of refuge between crossing directions, which also helps. Um, this crossing, as well as other ones that we'll show, um, they'll be pointed out exactly which ones have it, but we'll include the RFB setup that we see across town, having those rapid, the rapid flashing beacons for these crossings in both directions. And it will include accessible push buttons and signals that all of the features that come into this, and I'll try and name the ones that all that come to mind, but there's so many to it, that the push button itself will have the flashing light. It will have the locator tone. 
it will have actually a tactile arrow where you can actually feel the arrow that is indicating which way to cross. There's all these features built in for all users to be able to use these crossings. They will also have um, the extended push feature where, or I guess not on these ones, was it? It, it can, but where it gives you more audible cues for a crossing as well. If you hold it down, it offers that function as well. Okay, so this graphic here shows the current FOOTS network through the area with the different levels of improvements throughout, kind of uh, tying back to what we saw earlier with the uh, earlier presentation, you can see the Butler Avenue piece is right with caution, which uh, really is not the uh, best level it could be at. With the project, adding the buffered path as we put in here, but really the off street system that you already saw, it's really even a higher level than what we saw for the bike lane or shoulder, what's currently used in the graphics. So we did use this different indication for it. Looking at the pedestrian and transit treatments throughout the corridor, on the left-hand side, you'll see the paired bus stop that we already had that zoom in of at peak point that's halfway roughly between Little America and 4th Street. There'll be a new paired bus stop eventually. At 4th Street and Butler, there will be a total of four stops uh, a paired stop on the west side and then north and southbound uh, stops as well. We will be incorporating these into the project and Mountain Line is planning them for future use. The crossings shown in here, the kind of black dash lines indicate the enhanced crossings that we kind of saw already that every single one of these will include the rapid flashing beacon setup. So all four crossings at the Herald Ranch roundabout all four crossings at the Butler 4th intersection, whichever it turns out to be, and then the uh, paired transit stops as well. So we're now gonna take a closer look. We're gonna zoom in and take a look at that Butler 4th intersection. And this is where as a project team, we spent a fair amount of time discussing what this project was going to be. Um, Again, at this point, before we kind of dive into that, Nick's gonna talk through some of that process, but we we committed at a very early time to whatever intersection we build, whether it be signalized or whether it's a, a roundabout, we're committed to that gold standard. And I think Nick just spoke to a lot of those treatments with the rapid flashing beacons, all, all crossings will be signalized, having these accessible features and so on to make sure that we are serving all of the users of this corridor, um, regardless of their ability. So throughout this project, um, over the past many months, we started with a alternatives workshop. We eventually built it up to about 11, well, a total of 11 alternatives to look at and evaluate as this project progressed. Through a screening meeting, we took that down to three candidate alternatives. And for those three, we had a multidisciplinary review of, I can't remember the exact number, but 50 to 70 different pieces of criteria to evaluate these and the different needs and which ones are they meeting and how much that you'll see coming up. But from those three alternatives, we, at, we as a team selected a preferred alternative that we will also present to you all. The next two slides will show two of the alternatives that did not make it down to the three level and did not make it to preferred, but we still want to present to you all today and I'll tell you why. So the first one is the five by five signalized intersection. The nomenclature we'll be using through these next few slides for the signalized intersection, it indicates roughly how many lanes wide on the cross section. So kind of that east, west and north, south, it's five lanes wide approximately through this intersection. The benefits of this one was this, it was the smallest footprint of the intersections that we looked at. There's, because it's the smallest, we have reduced pedestrian and bicycle crossing lengths and across all of these intersect or these alternatives, you'll see protected intersection features, whether it's signalized or roundabout, and we'll discuss those in detail. The drawbacks was the queuing lengths and the significant delays and not meeting the city standards for delay. The next was a two by two roundabout. The roundabout nomenclature is a little bit different. The, in this regard, we're talking about how many circulating lanes there are. So you can see that there's two circulating across the entire roundabout. 
We see a lot of two by ones, one by one, but in this case, it's two all the way around. Benefits, reduce pedestrian crossing lengths. Again, that each crossing would be approximately two lanes, total of four to get across the entire side. And then reduce likelihood of high severity crashes. For the roundabouts, through geometry, we are able to force speeds down to about 15, 20 miles per hour on entrance and exit really of the roundabout at the intersection. We can use geometry, curb, all of that to reduce those speeds. So what happens with roundabouts and driver behavior is we do see an uptick in property damage crashes that again, just side swipes, maybe driver in familiarity, but we significantly reduce fatalities and severe, or high severity crashes. Drawbacks to this uh, intersection was increased low severity crashes, as we said, and again, significant delays, and this also did not meet uh, delay um, level of service standards. All right, this takes us into our three candidate alternatives to present to you all. The first was a seven by seven intersection, so approximately seven lanes wide on each leg. There's dual lefts, we have the designated right turn lanes, but it does have the protected intersection features that we'll have a zoom in in a minute. Alternative B is a six by six intersection. Again, roughly six lanes in each direction. You will see some buffer space um, for the southbound and westbound movements due to opposing single versus double dual lefts that the through lanes matching up, we had that area in the middle to kind of match up, unfortunately. So here's a zoom in of the protected intersection features that I'd like to touch on. So as Jeremy mentioned earlier, that one of the first pieces is the actual curb return, the radius at the corner is significantly reduced. In the past, there's been many intersections designed with 30, 40, 50 foot radius uh, curves which is very easy to make a right turn on and it's nice and smooth and you can make quite a quick right turn. We saw for safety purposes as a nation that, well, maybe we should make those a little bit tighter so it's not as comfortable to make a quick right turn. We should probably be slowing people down. So that's one of the first pieces on this one. The maroon area indicates a truck apron. This is going to be a mountable curb. As a passenger vehicle, it would be extremely uncomfortable to drive over it most likely possible, might cause some damage, but the intent is for the rear axles of a semi-truck semi trailer to come over it so they can still make the turn without taking up more of the intersection, but passenger vehicles are extremely discouraged from using that area. The green areas uh, behind that truck uh, apron indicate the bicycle kind of waiting area for making the next crossing movement. We have the pedestrian path behind the bicycle path and the truncated domes, the detectable warnings for users to cross, knowing that they're in the separate areas. And I think that's, oh, and sorry, and the designated uh, crossings for bikes and pedestrians, actual in the crosswalks, the green and white, as Jeremy brought up earlier. The third alternative, alternative C, is again a two by two roundabout, but this time includes channelized right turns on every leg. So each direction will have a right turn lane to queue up right turning traffic. So with this, again, as I was mentioned earlier, we can use geometry to slow down vehicles. That includes with the right turn movements. And another part of that too, that as we work through design, we'll be absolutely working to, we don't want that right turn lane, again, back to the signalized intersection to feel like an off ramp. It needs to feel tight, close, the vehicles need to slow down, look left, look right, and then proceed safely. Um, we'll be using rapid flashing beacons on every crossing. And then we'll also be evaluating raised crosswalks as part of the roundabout uh, setup. Um, I'd like, I would like to take this opportunity that we've been using through our various commission and public meetings that there is a new state law that I'm not sure if it's fully taken effect yet. Governor has signed it, it should be soon. But semi trucks in Arizona are now permitted to take both lanes in the roundabout and all other users must yield. So that's something that 
I care a lot about safety and I like informing people about it. We're trying to do that. But in the case of this project, it does help reduce the overall size of the roundabout that we can assume the semi truck does not need to be able to make that turning movement in both lanes staying within their lanes. But just as public information, trying to let the public know, semi trucks can take the full roundabout as they circulate through and all other vehicles must yield. And I think that's just important to consider because while that um, I think certainly changes maybe how we think about how a truck would utilize a roundabout and making that roundabout smaller offers, offers a lot of advantages for reducing speeds and so on. It's also just bringing reality in line with law. So you, if you've been in a larger roundabout with a truck, they generally do take more than one lane. And so this just allows us to plan for that, be able to keep that roundabout small and just put law in more in more in line with reality. And again, zooming into the crossing section of the uh, for the pedestrians and bikes uh, at the roundabout. Again, this is our preliminary design, but this is a concept of what it will look like. The benefit from the roundabout versus the other two intersections is while there's still an overall crossing distance that we'll touch on later, the maximum individual crossing is only two lanes with the roundabout. So that does help. And before, and before we move on, crossing in a roundabout as a pedestrian or a bicyclist is inherently different than in a signalized intersection. At a signalized intersection, you push the button, you get a protected walk phase. Um, at a roundabout, it is more of an active process where the, where all users have to be more active, engaged um, before you would make a crossing. And while that while that is a change, right? And I think we've heard we've heard stuff about comfort and so on. Um, so it may not be as comfortable. That that is it is a more active process. Uh, however, that engagement is actually has very strong safety outcomes. Um, combined with the lower speeds and so on that we see at roundabouts, pedestrian crossing at roundabouts are, are very safe, uh, bicyclists and so on. Um, so again, it's inherently a different experience, um, but it is, it is a very much a safe experience. As mentioned earlier, from the three alternatives, we really dove into a multidisciplinary review to determine the preferred alternative. We ultimately came up with seven group or categories of evaluation. Each one of these featured many subcategories to them as well. We'll be highlighting a few of them in detail, but we will be going touching on at least each one of them uh, in summary. So starting with vehicular operations, we looked at level of service and delay. We looked at VMT, VHT. We looked at emissions and driver expectation. Something to note on this is you'll see the VMT VHT is a build versus no build instead of across the different categories. Due to the modeling and using the overall regional model, it looks more at the connections between intersections than the intersections themselves. It's more of a macro model than a microscopic. So that is just a build versus no build for the, that evaluation material. Overall, the for the vehicular operations, the roundabout scored the highest. This scoring system you'll see through here is a one through five, with five being best and one being um, worst. All right, the next category was truck circulation. This was purely based on navigability, the ability for a truck to navigate the round, or sorry, any of the intersections and get where they need to go. But the roundabout, it will be inherently easier for trucks to make their way through the intersection. Really, with the other intersections in the current condition, it's about the same, making a left turn, um, heading up, forth, or coming down, coming back towards the interstate. Transit accommodation, working with Mountain Line. One of the guiding factors in this category was we showed earlier on the west side there's a paired bus stop. Mountain Line has to deviate throughout the day, and there's two routes that they leave from this intersection heading either northbound or westbound. So for that movement, they either need to hop in the first lane and continue through or get all the way across to a left turn lane or make that movement to go north. So with the roundabout, this did help with the smaller intersections. It helped. It's easier to cross less lanes, but with the 7x7 seven seven intersection, it was they would have to get about three, four lanes across 
to make that left turn movement. So, and there is there there is equipment available that could be used to give buses priority at signals. Um, it's quite expensive, um, and we did have some in depth conversations with Mountain Line about this. And while they're both showing scored the same between the six by six and the roundabout. Uh, the preferred alternative for Mountain Line, is really, at least as it relates to bus operations, is the round is the roundabout over the signalized intersection. All right, that takes us to pedestrian and bike circulation. So there was two subcategories in here, and working with Martin on this uh, very closely, all the intersections are still so large based on criteria developed that. They all scored poor, unfortunately, for the proposed intersections. The existing intersections scored poor due to lack of features out there currently. It's a kind of small and interesting intersection to be at as a pedestrian or bicyclist. For the ADA, uh, Americans with Disability Act, and just really universal design, designed to all users, we're going to be incorporating that regardless of which intersection, that all the current standards and better will really be put out there. As Jeremy said earlier, it will be the gold standard for pedestrian and bike treatments for crossings and moving through the corridor. Um, to note on this, you'll see that really why didn't these three score the same? Although they all had poor, it was felt that the smaller intersection should at least get one more point. There should be some difference for the six by six between the seven by seven. So it was given a three. All right. That uh, takes us to predicted crash frequency. Thank you. So we looked across the, um, did predictive crash analysis on the four alternatives, well, really the three in the no build condition. As we mentioned earlier with the roundabout that it really eliminates the fatal and severe, um, severe crashes. There's still the higher property damage, so it's not totally perfect. We do have that trade-off, but again, with the safe systems approach, eliminating fatalities and severe crashes is the goal. It scored a four, the other is a three, no build being a one. Moving on to pedestrian and bike interface. Several subcategories in this one. We looked at the maximum individual crossing length, so at any one time, what's that maximum length? What's the overall crossing length to get from basically one corner to the other? What are the crossing features? What is that, as Jeremy pointed out, the kind of scenario you face crossing? Vision zero alignment, which has these many subcategories within it, and then an overall score. So again, um, through here, the seven by seven, the alternative A and B, the crossing lengths are the same. It's again, one movement to get across, but it's larger length, the roundabout, 30 feet is the maximum individual crossing with 104 to get totally across the intersection. Uh, let's see, we talked about speeds. Yep. And while we considered the crossing length, um, there's also something to consider for crossing times. So if you've crossed at a signal, it depends on the, the cycle when you arrive, push that button, you may wait a minute or longer before you're actually given that crossing ability uh, versus a roundabout, which it being a much more interactive experience, it, it, is going, it is based on finding gaps and interacting with that traffic. We often find that that crossing uh, time is much shorter on a roundabout versus a signalized intersection. All right, so looking back at the, or sorry, one last category. That was the cost and land impacts. And here we looked at construction costs, maintenance costs, and also right-of-way requirements. That really the three build alternatives were about the same. Uh, they're very close in cost for between the three of them. The uh, no build, of course, is nothing. So it scored the best in this category. And that takes us to our total score here with the Alternative C scoring the highest, the roundabout with 24, alternative B was second, alternative A was third, and no build being last place. And at this point, it takes us to questions yeah. and discussion. 
Yeah, so before we go into questions and discussion, you know, we presented those two smaller alternatives at the very beginning when we looked at the alternatives. Um, and we, we are currently working to evaluate whether or not either of those smaller alternatives are candidates for a phased approach to where we could go out there and initially build a smaller version of that intersection that could be phased and additional lanes built at a later time. Um, but a lot of that revolves around when, how how long that horizon year is. So like, is it 10 years away that we would need to add additional capacity or so on? So we are, as a project team, working on that exercise. We don't have any answers of what that would look like today, but by the time we get to city council in November, we will have feedback on whether or not that is a possibility. And so with that, I think we open it up to questions and discussions. Once we've answered a bunch of questions, we will have the opportunity for the commission to score individually their rankings of the alternatives you just saw. You answered, I was gonna ask you if, you, if you're figuring in the excess traffic coming in John Wesley Powell figures for the one, but you, you partially answered that. I'd like to build on that just a little bit that we are factoring in as the earlier slide showed with all the developments, those are all factored in. We do have John Wesley Powell in there, um, assuming a connection from Harold Ranch down to John Wesley Powell as well. And that, that, that's pretty much. Mr. Chair, can I ask a couple questions? Um, sure, go ahead. All right, thank you guys for your presentation. A couple questions. One observation I made is if you're in the left lane approaching a roundabout, you have to change lanes in the roundabout or else you'd be in there forever. Is That's true, right? That doesn't tend to be a problem or? So with this roundabout configuration, you can either circulate or exit from both lanes. So there will be some driver education to that aspect, but e each lane coming around the roundabout can either continue or continue going around or leave as well. All right, so the left lane can exit, but it has to be careful so it doesn't interfere with somebody. Or actually, they have the right of way. Um, as far as the pedestrian crossings, when we looked at the roundabout at uh, the head, the north end of uh, Forest, Fourth Street, we put in where we could. We couldn't at all. What I guess is called a Z crossing, so that when a pedestrian, they don't get a straight shot. They have to kind of stop in the middle and and zig. And the idea there is that they don't just zoom across, especially kids. They kind of forces them to stop and look and evaluate. So is that something that's being considered for this? I think it will be something that we consider. Um, there's not clear guidance on whether or not Z crossings are truly necessary. Um, it makes sense for mid block crossings because we can take advantage of uh, the Z crossing and the effect that when you turn, you face traffic and you see oncoming traffic, largely based on the geometry of roundabouts it's, and where you want to place the, the, the crosswalks in relation to exiting traffic. We don't want them too far away from the roundabout because speeds will have increased as they accelerate leaving the roundabout. Uh, so it becomes kind of a balancing act of where to place that. And it oftentimes leaves you with like the opposite Z. So it still accomplishes what your or one of your original points, which is it it doesn't it's not just a straight shot. It it causes you to to pause, redirect and come across, but you're not necessarily facing traffic. So even if you don't have a Z, uh, it's probably a good idea to have a space where a pedestrian can stand there and wait for the traffic to go the other way. Correct. I assume yes. that will be included. Yes. So geometrics are hugely important to the success of a roundabout, both for speeds and for crossings, so providing large enough median refuges um, in between crossings for pedestrians. So the piece that's on the uh, screen right now, there's 
uh, not counting outside of the traffic lanes. When they're crossing, there's two places they can stop. So if so they can make it across the traffic at, say, going north and not worry about the traffic is going south and then make a separate decision on that. And my last question is, you briefly talked about expansion. Like, if is this corridor going to be limited to, in effect, to four lanes? Because if you wanted six lanes, then you'd have a three-lane roundabout. I presume that would be a little impractical. When I mentioned phasing, I was referring to the intersections specifically at Butler and Fourth. Um, I don't think there's been any considerations about a future, I guess, widening to six lanes for the corridor itself. We're just specifically talking about uh, the difference, differences between alternatives that you saw, a five by five versus a six by six or a two lane roundabout with right turn lanes versus just a two by two roundabout with no right turn lanes. So as a, uh, a three lane roundabout, something that just in practice isn't done? And that's my last question. So it is possible, but what we've seen across the nation is really that people have a very hard time understanding them. No matter how many signs, markings are put out there, it's large and confusing. So it's to be taken with a very important word of caution. Right now, we're not seeing the need for that at Butler Fourth, and ideally, we don't. But there's been a few installed across the United States. Uh, quite a few of them have been reduced after installation because of issues. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Good. I, could I just, I just have a little bit of follow up. This reminds me that education is an important component, right? We've got, I didn't do a great job of conveying this when we were at city council a few weeks ago. Uh, but we held that kind of roundabout discussion workshop where we had Mark Johnson come in and speak about. Uh, but really, that was kind of a kickoff effort for us. I think Jeff and, and our team is committed to kind of filling in the education gap. We've got a number of roundabouts that are in the pipeline that are either under construction or will be as soon as next year. That fourth locket roundabout will be slated for next year uh, to, to work on the public outreach and education to educate people on how roundabouts are intended to be used and so on. And specifically in the, the instance of the fourth locket roundabout, we've got a number of schools in the area and we wanna make sure that we're doing outreach and providing materials to support all the users of that intersection and make sure that we're doing it in a safe manner. Thank you so much, Nick and Jeremy for that presentation. Um, this is a really exciting change uh, that's a big change. So, you know, I look forward to um, what comes with it. One of my questions that I have is, you mentioned queuing lengths based on your modeling. Uh, and um, so when you do one of these models, uh, can you walk us through what data you get and what, how the model is run and then what's done with that queuing length and what that means? Yes, I can talk on that um, a little bit. Um, I forgot to mention earlier that I used to be the assistant county engineer for Coconino County and done quite a bit of TIA review over time. My primary, primary background is not so much traffic, so I may lean on Jeff's help for a little bit on this piece. But we modeled the intersection using the peak hour volumes. We had lane assignments. We basically had origin destination to determine where vehicles would go through the intersection. We had total volumes to look at. And through that modeling would generate a um, just backing up lengths, that queuing length, how many cars would back up at the intersection, total average delay for vehicles. Um, kind of running out of my vocabulary on this one. Jeff, is there anything you'd like to add for kind of the basic uh, analysis of it? Yeah, without going into the weeds too much, we relied on Metroplan and their models, their regional models. So Metroplan recently completed their regional transportation plan. They had this upward model and onward model. Dave Wessel, I think, came and did a presentation for us. So that's kind of the basic information of what we were looking at for this project. 
build year and then build out year, which is 2045. That's the planning horizon for Metro plan and the city also goes with that same planning horizon year. But as Jeremy mentioned, we're gonna take a look to see if there's kind of an expandable option, you know, 20, if, is there something we can build that lasts 10 years or so and then needs expansion that might be worthwhile um, as an option for city council to consider here in a couple weeks? Um, so once you, I guess one of the things that I find interesting is, um, is there any feedback system? So once you do this, you take this mesh network based analysis for Metro plan, you isolate a single node being this intersection and the data around the, that node, and then you generate queuing lines. Um, is it possible to put that data back into the mesh network and say, if we were to have these queuing lines, like does the traffic shift? Um, and do people find other ways to go such that, you know, the actual queue lines are not as significant as the model makes them out to be? Because sometimes you model like a half mile long queue and uh, traffic in Flagstaff gets bad, but um, usually people know if there's going to be a half line, half mile long line, and they'll go somewhere else. So we're kind of talking about two different models and two different two different things. So there's the regional model, which does this gravity based model, does look at some of the congestion factors, and but really it's based on it's called the gravity model. It's really based on time. How long does it take to get down all these different links? And then we extra, then we pull we pull those modeled volumes out, and then we put it into um, the actual queuing model, the intersection analysis. The intersection analysis doesn't have a feedback loop because you're just taking the volumes. You, you know, typically you're taking volumes you actually counted, or you're taking these projected volumes from the regional model, which does have some of that feedback built into it. What, what you describe is interesting because um, what we found in the regional transportation plan process with the onward and upward model is that when congestion increased in certain corridors, we did find people took other routes, but of, but of course those other routes are not as convenient or they would have taken them in the first place. So that congestion along 66 in different places actually drove VMT to rise significantly in the region. So there's a balance, right? We don't want to overbuild things, but we also don't want significant congestion because then people start driving longer distances. So I don't even know what the alternative would be if you lived if you lived in Country Club and you worked downtown and Butler was terrible, you go to Country Club and that would that would add a decent amount of VMT. Or maybe you'd walk or bike or ride the bus. I mean, there's options. Um, but yeah, that's it's uh, an interesting thing, the regional modeling. Yeah, I know at the, I guess my previous experience was um, seeing presentations on the Butler uh, Lone Tree intersection and, you know, there was projected very long queues and then you look at the regional model and said, oh, but, you know, our traffic on San Francisco went from 40,000 to 9,000, right? And so, like, that's a, yeah, it's just interesting um, as these queues stack up and we make decisions about the queue length, I want to make sure that we have, re like the models make sense in the end, right? Because like sometimes you feed stuff in and uh, it doesn't always, you extrapolate past the point of reason. So that was my question is how do we avoid getting to that and make sure that uh, we're getting reasonable models. And just to comment on that a little bit more too, that as it was brought up of the geographic location where we're at and the alternate routes that could be used is one part of it. The What we saw for the failing level of service that with the queuing that I just want to come out to that it was not preposterously gigantic, it is failing, but we were seeing one of the longest uh, delays was nine over 90 seconds, so about a minute and a half, and then the queue length being about a thousand feet. So. As, and I think it was talk, touched on too that there'd be kind of a rebalance of if it was really backed up, let me try a different route. Oh, more people are doing that too. It's backed up too. I, well, maybe I come back to this and kind of leveling off if there was something easy to take as an alternate route, but some folks may take the longer way anyways. So it's always dynamic. Question to follow up on that. Did your queuing models include the number of trucks that come out of Little America and around going to go around that roundabout at Harold Ranch 
because of the difference in the queuing model there with the same ice? Yes, it did. And it factored the trucks. Um, earlier on in the project, we actually looked at two different routing to that roundabout to see if it would help basically building a new road coming in from the south and making a truck just make a left turn through the roundabout instead of the U-turn movement. But that was all modeled. We looked at that as well and factored in that, again, taking up more space, less ability to get into a roundabout, uh, slower speeds as well. Um, one of my other questions was, um, the past I've heard talk of this um, intersection, there's been talk of raising it up some lumber of feet. Um, and there is a drainage that goes under that intersection in two locations. And I don't know if the uh, targeted increase in height of the, of the intersection combined with whatever bridge was gonna be over the drainage would allow for some sort of a pedestrian bike underpass opportunity uh, to take place there. And has that been considered? Yes. Uh, we've had conversations about that exact topic. Um, yes, the that intersection will be ra will be raised roughly six to seven feet, um, and there will be a crossing. It will likely be a diagonal crossing. Right now, crosses Four Street and then crosses Butler. It will likely kind of diagonally cross that intersection. It does it does provide some opportunities for us to consider a, se a separated pedestrian and bicyclist underpassing there. Um, I think we haven't made any decisions on it. Uh, certainly those things are costly. We've had a number of conversations with with Martin, our multimodal planner, about you know whether or not that's a good idea. It's not off the table. Um, I think it'll probably be something that we talk about when we get to, to city council. Um, so it is, it's still on the table um, and no decisions have been made either way on, on an undercrossing. Okay, I'm glad to hear you're talking about it. Excellent presentation, thank you. Um, my only question in considering these potential you know, intersections is about you know, proposed additional intersections. Is there anything that's gonna be coming down the pike that you are aware of at this point between Harold Ranch and 4th and 4th to the Sanagua Heights neighborhood? And you know, we're considering this you know, um, JW Powell you know, potential connection in the future for these different you know, vehicle patterns potentially, but is there anything along that Butler corridor we should be thinking about? Okay. Uh, I'll let Jeff correct me if I'm wrong, but right now I don't think there'll be any new intersections along this stretch. Uh, we'll have Butler Forth. The peak point has been recently built as part of that Canyon Del Rio. That's by that Bluff Senior Center. Um, and then of course there's Harold Ranch Road. And I think just based on that spacing, I don't think that there would be space for an additional intersection along that particular corridor. Um, based on the development that we have along 4th Street to the north, I don't think there's any real opportunity between Sparrow to add additional intersections as well. Um, and I would say the same headed to the east. Um, there may be driveways, you know, that state land on the southwest if, or the southeast corner if that develops. There's always the possibility that a driveway ties in. Um, but as far as... And then of course south, I know I think we have a good picture of what Canyon Del Rio looks like on the western side of 4th Street, at least for that portion south. Um, so I would say that the opportunities for additional intersections in this area is relatively limited. Mr. Chair, I have another question, follow up to this last comment. Certainly. Um, these other intersections that won't have roundabouts in them, will they be, people will be allowed to make left turns across all the lanes or will they have to go the other way and make a U-turn in one of the roundabouts? So the future for Peak Point, that will be the only intersection along this corridor on Butler that won't currently be a roundabout. I believe in the, in the initial condition that is uh, full access so they'll be, you'll be able to make a left turn there. Uh, there is some language that addresses this within the Canyon Del Rio Development Agreement um, that speaks about volumes along Peak Point um, may necessitate the need for additional um, additional intersection improvements. Um, I don't know what those look like, uh, whether it, it becomes a signal or whether you lose the ability to take a left turn and you have to go to the roundabout and, and, and do a U-turn. Um, so it's uncertain what the future of that intersection will be. Thank you. 
And I just add on that there are a number of driveways for those developments that you don't see yet today that are you know proposed along the corridor, and some of them will line up. Many of them will be right outs and need to turn around or yeah, right out only. So yeah, there's a there's a combination of things. I think the Bluffs has a combination. One driveway is full access and one driveway isn't. Yep. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Brandon, your question. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I just have one question. Um, is I didn't see it in the plans for the roundabout, but is there a way for cyclists to exit the bike pedway prior to the roundabout? Um, because more confident or faster cyclists will want to navigate through the travel lanes rather than having to deal with the crosswalk in, in getting through that intersection? It's something we, we've had that same question. We haven't made any decisions about, um, I think it adds some complexity complexities about how you might uh, introduce a bicyclist back into travel lanes uh, because you would generally do this in the area of the intersection um, and what that would look like, whether it's a roundabout or signalized intersection. Um, so I don't think that's been entirely set in stone. I think our preference at this point would be to keep those facilities separated, given some of those complexities about how to handle um, getting bicyclists back into the road. I don't know if you want to add to that, Jeff. Yeah, some of the some of the complexities and difficulties and even safety concerns for cyclists that multi-lane roundabouts are those are those vehicular cyclists that want to ride through the roundabout. Well, the crosswalks clearly are not as convenient for someone on a bike that used to, you know, comfortably can ride through a roundabout or on the street. They're quite a bit safer. Um, so yeah, I've heard I've heard when you have this configuration where you've already pulled the bike lanes off the street that you really don't want to put bikes back into the road um, for the for the intersection. So yeah, we'll have to think about it a little bit. But as Jeremy was mentioning, I mean the the specifics are. Normally, uh, you know, as you leave a roundabout, we have that ramp. You can call it an on-ramp or an off-ramp from, from the sidewalk back into the bike lane. In this configuration on Butler, there's no bike lane, so you would be kind of being sent. Your, your path would be right into a travel lane. You wouldn't have the bike lane buffer to get into, and, and you know, you understand what I'm saying. You ride a lot, but it, it's a tough one in this configuration because there's just nowhere to put a bike with any kind of transition, you would just be sent at like a 30 degree angle into a travel lane. And so it's generally recommended not to do that. Okay, thank you. So if there are no for the questions, maybe this is a good time to go to a public comment and then a discussion will happen about which one we go into. Does that make sense, Jeff, in this situation? Yeah, now is a good time to ask for a public comment if there is any, and then you can wrap up with a little more discussion before you vote if you'd like. Is there any public comment out there online or uh, in person? Seeing none, hearing none. Um, so let's move on to further discussion and then the voting process. Um, some of my, so I was able to watch the uh, presentation for the city council for the roundabouts. Um, and I guess what struck me was that for a single lane roundabout, it seemed like there were good ways to manage bike and peds and cars. Um, it didn't seem like it was all that convincing for multi-lane roundabouts that there were really good ways to manage those interactions. And I hear wording like active crossing and interactive traffic. Um, and as somebody who rides a lot, there's plenty of times when I ride in my right of way currently on the street. And it's pretty scary when you have cars coming at you and you're hoping they'll stop or not. And so it's one thing to say it's a learning process, but that learning process involves stepping out in front of moving cars. And so is that really part of vision zero? And if you go back to looking at the, the close-up diagram you have of the, of the intersection of the south side, that one right there, 
so that right, that right, not you don't call it a slip lane, the right channelized turn lane, the person at the end of that is staring to their left and 10 to 20 feet to the right of them is somebody crossing. And they're staring to their left patiently, trying to make sure no cars coming before they step on the gas to get out into traffic. And by the time they look the other direction, they're already in the crosswalk. Um, so I don't know whether commissioners have comments in, on that, but that's, I don't know, I guess like I don't, I'm, as you heard, I'm not entirely convinced of the safety of of these and of the, um, yeah, it concerns me, that's all. Brendan? Um, yes, I have, I have the same feeling as you do that um, I just don't perceive roundabouts to be very bike or ped friendly. And, um, you know, I don't feel confident navigating roundabouts in, in either fashion as a bike or, or a pedestrian. So, I mean, I'd like to see more information on that potentially. Sorry, something Sorry. Sorry. Are there any uh, other um, questions or comments from commissioners or should we go into this uh, voting process? Okay, well, let's let's do the voting then. All right, so All right, I do so have I the slide, slide up. up so. so sorry, we're getting that go again. Right. Um, do we want to? I'm not sure the best way to conduct this this voting pro this vote um, unless we just want to each want to go around and say which one of the three we prefer, which maybe is a good place to start. And if so we're chair, all so aligned, chair. then maybe. Uh, yep. Yep. So we have so we have the list. we have the list of the commissioners and yourself. Um, we were going to go through that list and ask that everyone rank them in a first, second, third, fourth. Uh, your preference being first, uh, going through that if that works for you all. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Crookshank. You had to choose me first. Um, <laughs> oh, and sorry to interrupt real quick. Uh, this screen doesn't include it, but we would like a ranking of the no build as well. So one through four, please. So do you want us to go ABC or do you want us to name the intersections? If you could start with your first and then second, third, fourth, that would be appreciated. Okay. Um, for right now, and I'm not sure I have all the information I need, I think I would rank uh, choice B, the six by six first. Um, then probably the roundabout choice C. And then, oh, I guess choice A before the no build. So B, C, A, and then no build. Thank you. Commissioner Denardi. Now at the second, uh, Commissioner Crookshank's uh, recommendation of BCA, no build. Um, I, I share the same sentiments and concerns of the travel lanes as they would uh, interact with pedestrians and bicyclists in those blinds uh, without further information. Uh, or study or even use of my own. I, I haven't seen such a robust roundabout that I've encountered in my travel, but that's that's of my personal opinion. Thank you. Commissioner Eckhoff. BCA no build. Thank you. That was BCA no build. I agree with you all so far. Commissioner Hansen. Chair Koenig? Um, I'm going to go with B. 
and then we're gonna go with the five by five, and then we're gonna decline to rank any any other ones. Um, I I want to be conscious of the process that we went through previously with the Butler four three or the Butler and Lone Tree round uh, process, where the commission ranked things, and then city council specifically chose ones that this commission wasn't didn't have the option to rank, and putting the seven by seven up there, you know, like I think that was declined the size of it and scale of it seems out of out of scale for our town in these areas and so um to to rank it at all i yeah, yeah i'm choosing not to rank it at all um so i'm going to stay with b and then the five by five and then uh nothing past that thank you commissioner coon I'll go CBA. I just think with the amount of growth out there and living out there and the speed that you you see now, you, we've got to slow people down. You got two major schools, you got other things there, you got everything coming. The roundabout will slow down people. Those intersections will speed people up. They tend to go speed up to go through them. Thank you. And then Commissioner Stone. Um, I would. Uh, choose B, C, A, A, and I just also wanted to echo um, Joe's concern that there was not the other potential options weren't really presented as options that we were allowed to choose from. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, may I ask a, another question? Another question. Um, I want to ask a question uh, first, actually. I, you know, I'm re I was really glad to hear that you guys had gone to the bike and ped committee before us, and then in my list of questions, I totally lost and forgot to ask what their input was. So, can you provide us some of the feedback that you got from the bike and ped uh, committee about these intersections and this process? Thank you very much Thank for asking that. Asking I was that. actually trying to pull it up too. So, for the pedestrian advi advisory committee. Um, across the board, everyone scored the no build as four, so I'll just leave that out from going through these. But for bicycle, it was actually uh, C and B tied uh, with the various rankings, so those were both kind of a preferred, with um, the seven by se seven now being third. Pedestrian, it was alternative B is first, alternative C is second, and alternative A is third. And then for sustainability, it was alternative C as first, Alternative B is second, and alternative A is third. Thank you for sharing those. Um, any further questions or comments by anybody on the commission? May I ask a May question? Ask question? Sure. Sorry, I missed that. Go ahead. And I'm not on and the I'm commission. Not... <laughs> um, a question I forgot to ask. And in, in the roundabout option, is there a possibility, and I'm not saying this is a good idea, I'm just saying, have you thought about it, uh, being a, a pedestrian being able to push a button that would warn cars that, hey, pedestrians are getting ready to cross, please yield to them. So we are signalizing all crossings at the roundabout. So there will be a button to push that will light up the rapid flashing beacons at all crossings at the roundabout, at either of the roundabouts and any of the mid block crossings. So there will be that it will be, <clears throat> excuse me. So yes, to answer your question. Okay, and then just a quick point that one thing I do like about the roundabouts is a pedestrians never have to cross more than two lanes of traffic before they can stop and be in a safe area. Where in intersections, they have to go across a lot of lanes before they get it. On the other hand, even in the intersection options, we could put a little safety place where people could stand in the middle. And then you could have people standing out there begging for money too. <laughs> You could. There are certain size requirements, minimum size requirements. If you do that, you need to have a button out there to allow them to call for a crossing. Um, but it's certainly possible. 
Um, I think historically multi-lane roundabouts are more challenging for all users. That's that's the reality. Um, and certainly they are they're most challenging for our most vulnerable users. So people that are visually impaired and so on uh, can be very hard to determine whether there's an acceptable uh, gap to cross within um, historically, historically roundabouts have not, not signalized, signalized crossings which like i said we've committed to this what we're calling gold standard for for any of the intersections um, whether signalized or a roundabout so we will signalize all those intersections so there will be advance notice to drivers that a pedestrian is there uh, to cross um, to help communicate that, slow people down, get people to stop and allow people to cross. And of course, speaking to those most vulnerable users, you know, we have we haven't figured out exactly what this will say, but there will be audible signals uh, to let someone know who who can't otherwise determine that the lights are activated um, in crossing, you know, crossing may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any further comments from anybody on the, on the uh, Transportation Commission? Well, thank you very much and thank you to everybody involved in the project. Um, like I said, it's going to be uh, a lot of work and a lot of construction, but that area could really use it because <laughs> right now the bike lanes are even worse than they, than they were uh, when the construction started. Yes. We'd like to thank the commission for hosting us today. We would like to invite you all. We have our public meeting. We've got the information up on the screen right now. It'll be held uh, Wednesday, October 18th at the Aquaplex, 5.30 to 7. This will be an in-person only meeting, so we are encouraging people to attend. Uh, let us know what you think. Engage with this process. Engage with the project as we move through. You know, Our intent is really to get to council in November. Uh, and hopefully get some clear direction as far as what this project will look like. At that point, that's where we will actually go into design. So that's one thing we didn't really talk about, but it's a dis distinction between what you saw with Butler and Lone Tree. We haven't actually done design. That's why we stress that what you're seeing is preliminary. Uh, so we're having all these conversations now to determine what the future of this project looks like. We are, we encourage you to participate in that process and we look forward to moving this item forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, that completes section two of our agenda. Um, section three of the agenda is old business. There's none there. Um, section four is concluding general business. So is there any um, informational items to or from the commissioners and staff? Yes, thank you, Chair Koenig. Oh, what's that? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'll be back. Not hearing any commissioner discussion, maybe we'll jump into the staff updates if that's okay. All right. For Boulder, for Boulder, Boulder Point and Woodland Drive, David is the project manager, so I'm gonna get I'm gonna have let him do these and I'll just stand here and sure, sure. All right. Uh, thank you, commissioners. So uh, Boulder Point traffic calming. Uh, that has been expanded to include uh, Woodland Drive. Those are both part of the same project. We're uh, doing some traffic calming work on both those roads, which includes traffic circles, curb extensions, and um, uh, some minor restriping. And right now we have gotten our 100% plans back from our consultant, and we're working to get those to our job order contractors by the end of the week to uh, get a, um, a feel for how this could be constructed, hopefully this fall before the winter. So we're still pushing to get that completed. Uh, this has been an important project to a lot of people in the neighborhood. So um, we'd really like to get it done this fall. And that's where we're at with those two projects, two and three. Those are kind of the same uh, project. 
And um, while I'm up here, uh, I know that there's Trails End, but that's that's actually, I think, Steph and Jeff and Reed. But I would like to look at the, the bottom one uh, is Fremont, and um, that's another traffic calming project. And currently, we have worked internally to settle on a few different cross sections for that street um, that redistributes the, uh, the, the width of the street to more parking and buffers for bike lanes. And we're in the process of mapping that out in plan view to work out transition points. So we, we don't have a visual for that yet, but hopefully either in the next transportation com commission meeting or the meeting after, we'll have uh, plans of that to show you that we can move forward with. And I think I'll step back and let uh, Steph and Jeff uh, cover these other items. Hi, it's Steph again. Um, I'm gonna be a creeper and just stay over here. So I'll cover um, Trails End. So during the last uh, Transportation Commission meeting, the commission voted to prohibit trucks on Mountaineer. Um, the appeal time has passed and we've submitted a work order to Public Works and the sign has actually been installed. Um, I've got a picture just because it's kind of fun. Um, there it is. So we put the little plaque up top. There was already a plaque that said Dodge. Um, so we added the word Mountaineer on there as well. So it was a pretty, a pretty quick install for Public Works. Let's see, um, more updates on this. We actually set traffic counts, some tubes out on Trails End, on Mountaineer and Smoke Rise um, on 9-11. Um, these were locations that we had counted previously shoot maybe three or four times many, many years ago. So we've got some updated data there. We can look at some of the, how the trips have changed, if there's more trips cutting through, um, just get a feel for what the neighborhood's doing now that we've got the retreat circle um, development completed. We also set a couple cameras out there on 919. Um, we get about 12 hours worth of data on a battery of a camera. We had a camera up at Trails in an 89, the intersection. We'll be able to do a um, signal warrant analysis there. Um, we've got some people that are interested in a signal there, um, including Mountain Lion and then some other groups um, internally. So uh, we were waiting for that retreat circle to build out once again to get those counts, see if a signal is warranted. And then we also had a Another camera aimed towards the driveways of the Sacred Peaks Health Center. We've had complaints that people are making um, right turns out of there and cutting through on Mountaineer um, just to avoid having to make a left or right out onto 89. So we have the data, we have not compiled it yet. Um, we've got the video footage, sorry, and we need to compile that data. So that'll be um, exhausting, but it'll be great. Um, last thing, we planning actually, Planning staff wrote a uh, city council report um, that was emailed to council September 14th regarding um, some of the other um, complaints that we've heard for this trails end and the uh, excava 108 excavating and stuff. So I've got a copy of that and we can send it out to the commission if anyone else is interested in seeing that. Um, we'll just send it out after this meeting and I've got some printed copies for anyone that's here. That's all I've got, thank you. Maybe I'll jump in on number five, pilot bike lanes. The last time we talked, uh, we were talking about removing some of those curbed sections. Those have all been removed. People have probably noticed the buffered bike lanes have been striped. Generally good feedback on that that change, so that's really good. It'll also be a, a lot easier, I would say a little, but a lot easier for public works to maintain this winter. Um, we were asked to come back to city council again this fall, so we have that scheduled. I don't have the date top of my head, but I think it's about five weeks out to talk about the pilot bike lanes with city council again. We are trying to get um, a Butler speed study done in that same time period because city council asked us to take a look at speed limits along Butler. So definitely look at, definitely pilot bike lanes in November and hopefully um, look at the speeds along Butler. The hoses are out still now, I believe. Butler feels like in this section that's kind of broken into maybe three, at least three distinct sections. So we're counting in front of the sawmill area. Uh, we're counting just east of San Francisco, and then we're counting between Milton and Bieber. So three different sections, which kind of have different characteristics. So more to come on that. Uh, we just recently submitted some transportation alternatives grants, but I don't want to steal Chris's thunder because that was his project. So I'll let him come back up and tell you about those. We're really excited to get those turned in. Hi, 
so yes, on 9-29, we submitted our second of two app applications for the Transportation Alternatives Grant. Uh, it was a two-stage application. The, it was a screening that was applied for um, back in the end of August, and then we were approved. And now we submitted the final application for that. Um, the project is for construction funds for two protected intersections on Butler Avenue, at, one at Beaver, at its intersection with Beaver, and the other at its intersection with San Francisco. Um, it would essentially uh, provide much more sound infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, including separation of their facilities, as well as uh, signals specifically for cyclists. Um, so now we are anticipating hearing back on that on November 17th, um, but it should be noted that those two intersection, uh, protected intersection projects were incorporated into the SS4A grant submission that uh, we put out over the summer and are waiting to hear back from as well. We're trying our hand at several different grant cycles for the same projects. So hopeful one of them comes through. Those are expensive projects, but really important projects. With that, that's our updates for tonight. Hey, Next. Jeff, I think we had one more possibly um, not listed on here. Um, switching the day. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, so the way these projects come through, like tonight, the Butler Corridor, it ends up taking kind of an extra month because the Bicycle Advisory Committee and Pedestrian Advisory Committee occur after the Transportation Commission, but we always like to go to them first. So they heard the presentation you heard last month, and now you are hearing it this month. So one of the, and this room is fairly heavily booked, but the Bicycle Advisory occurs on the first Thursday, heads occur on the second Thursday. So if we could switch with the Historic Preservation Commission, and they are they are interested and they're gonna to talk to their commissioners as well, but if we could switch transportation from first Wednesday to third Wednesday, then we would have this nice order of bicycles would happen one week, heads would happen the next week, transportation commission would happen that third week. We would do this for next calendar year because the rooms are all booked. I just wanted to throw it out there to this group to think about, check your calendars. We can talk about it again in December when we get back together, but um, it potentially could really streamline the process of bike, ped, transportation commission. So thank you for reminding me. And again, I've reached out to, to that group. The staff is interested, kind of like I'm interested, and they're gonna talk to their commission here in a couple, two weeks, I guess, from tonight and see if they have any objections to that. So just want to make you aware of that. And that, with that, I'm done. I'm sure. Great. Well, thanks, every, thanks everyone for those updates. Um, I said, Jeff, I'm glad to hear that, you know, we're trying to streamline things between the committees. And so uh, hopefully that winds up working out for everybody. Um, and with that, do I need to call, um, somebody have to call a motion to adjourn? No, you can adjourn the meeting, Chair. Great. Well, I'm going to adjourn the meeting then. Thanks for everybody. For, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you.